Hi, welcome to Studio 45's online service. My name is Jesse Mahana. I get the privilege of being a staff pastor here at New Spring. And though the room looks empty now, this is Studio 45 on the weekend. Studio 45 online service is more than a video, but a part of something amazing. You will learn about some awesome big ideas, which are something God wants to do inside you to change the world around you. Our biggest ideas are the big three, and we hope that while you join us online, that you know that you should treat others the way you want to be treated. Make the wise choice and trust God no matter what. So get your favorite snack, crank up that volume, and get ready because we start in three, two, one. The Bible is more than a single book. It's a collection of 66 books of history, stories, letters, and poetry written by dozens of different authors over thousands of years that all come together to tell one big story. It's a bigger story than you can even imagine. It's a big story about a really big God and what He did to rescue us. It shows us who we are and what we were created to do. Discover the story that shows you the character of God. All right, everybody say creation! Hey, there you go. Say, God made the world. God made the world. And everything in it. it. See, you just had to say it and the lights would come on. You didn't know that's the way it worked, but it is. Hey, this month we are talking about creation. Uh, We started the month off talking about it. We opened the book of Genesis, the beginning of your Bible. We talked how God breathed life into the the universe. This awesome, awesome uh, subject. Now, here's the thing. I don't know about you, but does anybody in the room love science? Anybody really love science? I'm a science nerd. I, I, I'm, a, I'm not a scientist. I'm a pastor, but I love learning about science. It's so amazing to see how God made the world. Now, here's the thing. I'm really excited to be with you in person this week. It's not digital, Jesse. Isn't this great? Yay. Okay. Uh, but here's the thing. I will tell you this. I will tell you this. Uh, when I was here a couple weeks ago digitally, I showed you a picture. I don't know if you remember this picture, but I showed you guys a picture. If you weren't here, you might have missed it, but I showed you this picture. And sometimes people will see this picture and they'll ask the question, who's right? Yeah, well, they'll say both. Well, both are right. You know, from this person's perspective, it looks like a six. And from over here, wait a second, that doesn't look like a six. That's a nine. And say, oh, they're both right. But the truth is, if they want to know who's right, they have to ask the person who put it there, who made the number. Hey, did you want this to be a six? Did you want it to be a nine? Why didn't you put a line under it? Like, oh no, what's the matter with you? Okay, whatever, right? They'd have to ask the person who put it there. The truth is there is a right answer. We just don't know what it is. Now, here's the thing. The reason why I show you this picture is because the truth is there are questions that I don't, I can't give you the for sure answer. I can give you what I think. And what we said was there was a worldview that everybody has. That's kind of a big word, but you guys are, you guys are fourth and fifth graders. This just means how you look at the world. And there are people that view the world as there is no God. And there are people that view the world as there is a God. And I remember as a fourth grader and definitely fifth grade, I thought that, that we were saying something, because here's the thing. What we are not saying here is that it's on one side you have God and then you have science. That's not what we're saying. And I remember as a kid, I thought that. I thought it was kind of God versus science. But the truth is, that's not the case at all. There's people in the world that believe there is a God, yes, and there are. this is what we are saying, okay? What we are saying is there's people that believe there is a God, there's people who believe there is no God, they both look at the same evidence, and this is really important for us to know. There are people that believe there's a God that use science. There's some really smart science Christians. Did you know Isaac Newton was a Christian? Did you know Galileo was a Christian? A lot of famous scientists were Christians. So both people will try to use science. Both people will try to use logic. And here's the other thing too. There are people that believe there is a God and it's sort of just a blind belief. It's just, well, my mom and dad said there was, so I just believe there is. And they've never looked at the evidence for themselves. There is blind belief on the faith side. And in the Bible, did you know the Bible doesn't ask us to have blind belief? The Bible asks us to have faith in God But God has proven that he's faithful. So listen, boys, this is important because there's blind belief on this side, but there are people that believe there is no God and they believe that, for instance, they believe you didn't, you weren't created. You just were the the result of evolution, cosmic chance. And if you really push them as to why they believe that, it's, it's blind belief. I don't know. It's just what I was taught. 
And so, guys, I just, the reason why I say that is because, honestly, I kind of like to think of God as a scientist. So I'm going to make a, a sort of a science experiment. You guys want to see a science experiment? Okay. I love science, like I said. So well, let's imagine we were talking about how God created the world, right? So let's imagine God as a scientist because here's the deal. If you've, ever know, if you've ever known someone who's really analytical, if you've ever known someone that really likes to think and process and, and dissect things, right? It's kind of a scientist's mind. I believe God made that mind. He put his image in that person. So yes, there are some ways that God is, is kind of like a scientist. He's methodical enough to think up DNA. Think about it. And on the first day, we learned how God made, there was darkness, and there was also light. And God said it was, anybody remember what he said? He said it was good. He kind of added both of those things to his little mixture there, okay? Uh, and then on day two, anybody remember what happened on day two? God made the sky and the water, right? Now, you guys, everybody take, take a big, deep breath in. <sighs> Let it out. <sighs> Tell your neighbor, hey, brush your teeth. No, just kidding. Okay, but when you just breathe in, you don't realize you breathe in oxygen, some carbon dioxide, some nitrogen, some hydrogen, all that makes up the air. God spoke all of that into existence. Then on day three, God had the water go to where it's supposed to be, and dry ground appeared. He made all the plants, and those plants could produce more plants by the seeds that they had. On day four, God made the sun, the moon, and the stars. I don't understand how this works scientifically. I'll be honest. It makes my head hurt. But God made light before there was the sun. How did he do I don't know. It's really interesting, though, especially when... And so, okay, anyways, it's interesting. It's fascinating to me. God, on day five, I picked red for this because God, God made all of the birds of the air. Don't you think of a, like a bright red feather, right? All of the birds of the air, God made those... And he also made on day five, anybody else remember? The fish, yes, God made all the fish. We'll add some more blue in there. And this is a cool, cool looking concoction we got going on here. Uh, day six, God made, what do you make first? All the animals, all the land animals. So I think of like a, a tiger's orange stripes. Did you know tigers have orange and black skin too? It's not just their fur, it's really cool. And then, we talked about this last week. Miss Debbie talked about how on day six, God made people. He made you, congratulations. And he made you in his image. And here's, does anybody want to know why I picked purple for that? I picked purple for that because purple in the Bible, a lot of times, is the color for royalty. And when you read how God created man and woman, he made Adam and Eve in his image, he created them to take care of the earth, to take care of the animal. How many of you guys like this? Isn't that pretty? Isn't that really pretty? What a beautiful world. Okay, now, that's just recap. That's just what we've been talking about. Now we're going to go to Genesis chapter 2. Everybody say Genesis 2. Genesis. Genesis 2, we read this. The Lord God placed the man in the garden of Eden to watch over it, but he warned him, you may eat freely from any tree in the garden of Eden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. Now, God puts, he makes a perfect world. He creates Adam. The only time he says it's not good is when Adam is alone, which is why God created Eve, all right? Okay, God creates Eve. And then he puts in the middle of the garden, he puts a tree and he says, this is the knowledge of good and the knowledge of evil. And he gives people a choice, right? God didn't want robots to follow him. He wanted a relationship. My wife was just up here helping with the camera. And can I tell you something? When I asked my wife to marry her, I said, will you marry me? I did not go up to her and said, Sarah, you will marry me. Okay, that would be, she would run away. That's creepy. You know what he says that? A relationship is a choice. And God gave our, our first parents, Adam and Eve, he gave them a choice. He said, hey, listen, you, don't, you, you have a choice. You don't have to follow me or you can. And he puts in this, car. now here's the deal. I have this little vial. This little vial has a little bit of oil in it. Okay, now this was colorful sand cool to look at, fun to look at, but this oil represents the choice that they had. And in Genesis chapter 3, we read what happens. Everybody say, Genesis chapter 3. Genesis. It says, the, ser the serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. And one day he asked the woman, 
Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Now, we know because Scripture tells us this, Jesus tells us this, that this serpent represents Satan. And Satan is not God's opposite. He's not God's equal. Some people think that. That's not true. Satan was an angel. And he said, I'm tired of people worshiping God. You should worship me instead. And God thumped him out of heaven and said, that's not how it works here. And because of that, he's had an axe to grind against God ever since. And so he goes to God's creation, his prized creation, and he, he asks them that question. And, and Eve responds. She says, of course we may eat from the trees in the garden. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we're not allowed to eat. And God said, you must not eat it. And then she adds to it, or even touch it. If you do, you will die. And watch this. Satan lies to her. He says, you won't die. God knows your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it. And you'll be like God, knowing both good and evil. Now, before this moment, they had only one rule. And that one rule was this. This, the tree in the middle of good, uh, good and evil, it's off limits. And she starts looking at it, and she's convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful. She saw that its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Now all the guys say, oh. Yeah, guys, help me out. Come on, say, oh. Come on, Eve. But watch this. Are you ready? You can blame Eve. But listen, then she gave some to her husband, who was with her. Why is Adam not jumping up and down? Eve, don't do it. He's not doing that. In fact, the Bible really kind of sets it up. Eve was deceived, but Adam knew what he was doing. And at that moment, when he eats of it, their eyes are open, and they felt shame because they were naked. There was no rules. They didn't have a dress code. And so they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves up. The Bible actually says they were, so, they were so afraid and ashamed that when the cool evening breezes blew through, the man and the wife heard the Lord God walking in the garden. So they hid from the Lord. And the Lord said, where are you? The man says, I heard you walking. I was afraid because I was naked. He said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? And then the Bible tells us that Adam blames Eve Eve blames the serpent, but the bottom line is the thing that they were told to avoid was mixed in with God's beautiful world, and there's a consequence now. They were actually asked to leave the Garden of Eden, and if you notice something here with this oil on this, what do you think this, that does to this glass? Anybody know? It makes it slippery. Wow, that's amazing. I don't know. It broke every time in practice. There it is. Now, here's the question. Is the world broken? It is. It is. Is the beauty that was there still there? Yeah, you can see the orange. You can see the yellow. You can see the blue. But the truth is, if I ask one of you to come up, hey, would anybody like to play in the sand? <laughs> You might want to play in it for a second, but as soon as you put your hands in it, yes, is it beautiful? Yeah, you'd see the bright colors, but you'd also cut your fingers on the glass. Guys, this is so important for you to understand the world around you. If you don't get this, you'll be confused your whole life. God made the world and everything in it, but God never wanted the world to be broken. Romans 5.12, do you know what Romans 5.12 is? It says that because of sin, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Yes, they had to leave the garden, but more than that, the world was broken. God's perfect world was broken. Here's the thing. God made the world and everything in it. But when I tell a kid that, some kids will say, so does that mean God made cancer? No. God made cells to replicate and reproduce, and then brokenness entered the world, and now they don't stop when they should sometimes. You guys understand, it's so important we understand. Yes, is the world broken, but God never meant for it to be broken. And that is a huge problem for us because that means that yes, God created a beautiful world. Yes, we can still see some of the beauty, but it also looks a lot different than what God originally intended. Did you know the book of Isaiah describes heaven like this? It says the wolf and the lamb will feed together and that the lion will eat hay like a cow. Now, when I was growing up, I always learned that if it has sharp teeth, it eats. Yeah, that's what I learned too. But you guys know a panda has sharp teeth and it eats bamboo. And the way that's explained is, oh, well, it used to eat meat and then it evolved to not need meat anymore. Or maybe everything with sharp teeth didn't originally need to kill other things. 
because we lived in a perfect world, and that perfect world got broken. But here's the good news, because it's important that we understand that to have a life that makes sense so we're not confused when we see brokenness in the world, that's the result of sin. But what is the good news? Because it's really discouraging for me to leave this, this story and say, well, sorry, you guys are in a broken world. Here's the good news. Second Corinthians says this, Christ didn't have any sin. Now, I want you to imagine I had one little vial of oil. But this verse says, God made Christ sin for us. When Jesus came to this world, he lived a perfect life. He laid that life down on a cross, and on Jesus was laid the sin of the world. Your sin, my sin the sin of your parents, the sin of every single person was put on Jesus. And here's the thing. I could take these broken pieces. Oh, it broke a little bit more. I could take these broken pieces and clean off the oil from them. But what's the problem? It's still what? Broken. broken. And the Bible tells us this, even though God's not going to fix the world, we're going to talk about how God has a plan to fix the whole world later. In fact, that's next week, so come back. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it tells us this, 5.17, it says, when anybody lives in Christ, the new creation has come. The old brokenness in Jesse and the old brokenness in you can be given to Jesus And when we do, something amazing happens. God takes that brokenness, and through Jesus, he makes us 100% completely brand new. Now, listen. This is important. Romans says this. It says, Adam's sin brought condemnation to everyone because of it. Because everyone went on to sin. But Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God. Remember how I said we, that purple represents royalty? Remember that? Jesus' perfect life, when I put my faith in him as my savior, gets credited to my account. And no, God hasn't made the whole world better. The world is still broken. But when I put my faith in what Jesus did for me, the fact that he took my sin and paid for it on the cross, he makes me brand new. And because of that, because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners. But listen to this. Romans tells us because one person obeyed God, Jesus, many can be made righteous. God never wanted the world to be broken, but it is broken. And because it's broken, he sent us Jesus. And that's something to celebrate. Let me pray for you. Father God, I pray for every kid in this room. We see the brokenness when we look around. We see people angry with each other. We see people cruel to each other. We see pain and sickness, but we know that those things were not made by you. They're brokenness brought by sin. Help us to put our faith in what Jesus did for us on the cross. So like 2 Corinthians tells us, we can be made new. You can fix the brokenness in us so that we can be a light in a broken world. All God's children said? Hey, thanks for letting me be here this weekend, guys.